Let's see. Yeah. Mm, I just got to climb up the call. Good evening, everyone. I want to call this meeting of the Board of Education to order. We'll start by reciting our vision statement. Every school will be a thriving school that prepares every student to graduate from high school, college, career, and community ready. I move to suspend the rules and to move item 5.1 titled Celebration up to this point of our agenda before public input. Um, before I do that, I just want to verify um, that we don't have any written registrations for public comment. Do we have any registrations online? All right, so we will, we will move into minutes after we hear from item 5.1. Do I have a second on that motion? All those in favor? Aye. Board Member Gomez Schmidt. All right, so item 5.1, we will hear from you, Dr. Jenkins. Okay, okay great. Okay, there we go. Uh, First of all, thanks, uh, Chair Muldrow and members of the board for suspending uh, order tonight because this is a very special month uh, for us. And being that it's a very special month, we have some individuals within our community that have just done some outstanding uh, work in our community. They've done some work statewide and nationally, and we want to take this opportunity to recognize some individuals that are very special. And tonight, we have an opportunity to recognize one special individual that's still an employee here in MMSD. And I think this sets the gold standard of being an employee as she's beginning on her 50th year. <laughs> a 50th year in the district. Let's give a big hand there. Marilyn Irvin really needs no introduction to everyone in MMSDR community. But what you don't know, she works all the time. Through the pandemic, she was in the office. She reaches to everyone. She has a very special touch. And she's never met an individual that she wasn't a friend to. Tonight, we want to recognize her. She's on Zoom, as she couldn't be here, the first time she had to be absent from a meeting or something like that. So look up at the... Uh, if you would to Zoom, let's give her another big hand there. Woo! She has served in our payroll, our business office, and I'd just like to say under the leadership to Mr. Ross McPherson, and he has definitely uh, just given her accolades along with the rest of the team, but she sets the bar for all of us, and we just wanted to say publicly, thank you, Ms. Irving, for all the work that you've done over the years, and we look forward your next 50 years of service. <laughs> <laughs> and that being said, Dr. McGregory is going to present virtually you with this award. This is only the gold standard award that you're going to get, okay? Mr. McPherson will come up and take the award. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> That's beautiful.
Now, this is Women's in History Month, and we want to definitely say that thank you, Ms. Irvin, for starting us off. But now we have a few more individuals we want to recognize. This individual is our MMSD's first African-American female chair of the board. She's taken us right now. She's been on the board doing outstanding things during the pandemic and after the pandemic, and will be leading us into the next phase of where we're going in MMSD. And this is Ms. Ali Modra, and she's very surprised. She had nothing to do with the award. <laughs> Mr. Castro, our board member, is going to present her with the awards and say a few words about it. No, he's not. I'm going to say a few words. <laughs> first of all, not only just being the first African-American president, Ms. Modra have done a number of things. Ms. Moldrev is a writer, instructor, advocate, yes, and a part of doula. She began her work in education in 2006 when she became the after-spoken word club liaison for East High School in partnership with UW-Madison First Wave. Often, she is spoken about by Dr. Floyd Rose in saying she represented the district in the academic challenge. And she did a fabulous job. So congratulations there, Ms. Ali Moda. Thanks, y'all. The next person up, uh, I didn't see Melinda yet. Okay, but I'm going to go on with the next person, which really needs no introduction to our community time and time again. We have Ms. Carolyn Stanford Taylor. The women are just doing it up this month. Miss Carolyn Stanford Taylor was our first and only African American state superintendent. Give her a big hand. Carolyn's career in education spans 42 years, 21 of which she spent at MMSD serving as a teacher, principal, and a district administrator. Carolyn has also shown us how to retire and to come back and help MMSD. We really appreciate her in her new role as Deputy Superintendent in the MMSD. Let's give it up for Ms. Carolyn Stafford. Woo! Okay, this is really getting great. In the state of Wisconsin, we have one individual that's known to many that continues to serve. She was bold. She was bold in 1991. She stepped out to become the first, the first African-American mayor in the state of Wisconsin. Yes, yes Ms. Francie Huntley Cooper. Please come. <laughs> She is a proud graduate of North Carolina A&T, uh, HBCU, woo woo. And she serves as an excellent role model then and now for not only just Madison, but throughout the state. Her name is known, her service is widespread, and she continues to help in every way that she can. And we just wanted to say thank you, Ms. Frances Huntley Cooper. And in her absence, I want to recognize a friend to not only Madison Metropolitan School District, but to the city, an individual that continues to give and st known statewide as we continue to face the challenges in education. She's been at the forefront. Superintendents all admire and want to try to steal her from Madison. And I say, no way. Uh, we're talking about the one and only Miss Melinda Heinrich. He's not right here now. But Vanna White, I mean, Dr. McGregory, will definitely uh, share this award with her. And this last individual 
that we have to recognize tonight. I think we all should know her, but may not know her. But her service locally, state, and internationally has been something that we all could be proud of. And I'm going to take the time to read her bio here, some positive things that's been said about her. In her 36 years of service in the Army, General, General Anderson earned Woo! many awards, including the Army Distinguished Service Medal, Army Commendation Medal, and the Achievement Medal, among others. After her retirement from the military in 2016, General Anderson was awarded the Association of the United States Army Major General James Earl Rudder Medal. In addition to being inducted into the Army's Women's Foundation Hall of Fame, wow, as a civilian, General Anderson served as clerk of court for the United States Bankruptcy Court for the Western District of Wisconsin. General Anderson retired from the Reserve Army in 2016 and from her civilian job in 2019 and was appointed as a member of the Green Bay Packers Executive Committee in 2021. Please keep the quarterback. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. General Anderson earned a bachelor's degree from Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, law degree from Rutgers School of Law, and is a graduate of the United States Army War College. That's a big deal. She serves as a role model for women, for men, for women of color, and throughout our country, and is known around the world. General Anderson, please step forward. At this time, could we have all of our individuals being recognized, please step in the front so we can take a photo with the board. And we'll have our board members take this picture right now so that we can post it out, okay? Thank you so much. All board members, please join the uh, recipient. Chair Moldra, board members, I want to thank you for allowing us to recognize a group of outstanding women in our community, and we need to continue to recognize our women for all of their contributions, and that is MMSD's Impact Award for Women of the Month. Thank you again.
Second. I approve. Unity, 42 years ago, in 1981, Congress passed the first request for Women's History Month to be acknowledged as a federal celebration. Therefore, the board would like to acknowledge Women's History Month and the significant contributions women have made for the betterment of our community locally and worldwide. The board would also like to thank MMSD community for participating in four listening sessions held earlier this month. We appreciate hearing your thoughts, comments, and comments about how we can improve our school district to best serve the needs of our scholars, families, and communities. Um, it was deeply moving to hear from our community at our listening center se sessions. Um, and I will be forever grateful for the opportunity to hear from folks and very grateful to the MMSD staff who supported the board in coordinating those listening sessions. Celebrating our students, congratulations to East High School senior Pajada Ba on being named the Wisconsin State or Student Journalist of the Year by the Wisconsin. Yes, uh, by the Wisconsin Journalism Education Association. The award comes with a thousand dollar scholarship for her continued studies. It moves her into Journalist of the Year contention at the national level. The association had this to say about Kajada. Above all else, your leadership and ability to use journalism to improve your community is excellent. It is clear that you have dedicated yourself to this craft and helping spread your passion and skills to others. You, your advisor, and your entire school journalism program should be proud. Congratulations. Celebrating our staff, the board would like to uplift the work of our teachers and school staff in creating opportunities where scholars can explore new interests and dig into their passions. A few examples of this can be seen from the activities around the district this month, like the 56th annual Strings Festival, the Young at Heart student exhibit at the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art, explorations of skilled trades during recent field trips. Thank you, MMSD staff, for your efforts to create thriving learning spaces. And now we'll hear from our superintendent on item 5.2. Okay, great. And just before we start on item 5.2, I also want to take just one moment to recognize one of our staff for outstanding work done in terms of really being all in about our students. At our elementary school, at Franklin School, we had a young person who had some medical challenges. And I just want to recognize the principal and the staff for the way that they just jumped in and did some of those unsung hero things that we don't talk about all the time. And they were there to help recover a student who had to have a serious medical situation, but our staff just jumps in like that on numerous occasions whenever we see a student really in need. So I wanted to say to the Franklin staff, but also to all of our staff who jump in to help our students daily to get to school. And next, um, thank you for that. And next, we're going to come up with our report that we have from our joint ventures group, and they shall be coming on right now. We have Drs. Uh, Maxine McKinney, Royston and Dr. Moultrie and Ms. Gail Anderson. They're going to be presenting it. So. And is that my cue, Dr. Jenkins? That's your cue. Yes, thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you so much. As the PowerPoint um, loads up for all to see, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank um, MMSD leadership 
uh, for allowing us to not only be able to engage in this work together as a partner, but for us to have this opportunity to come to the board once again. As Dr. Jenkins mentioned, uh, the, today's PowerPoint and the report was completed by Ms. Gail Anderson, uh, Dr. McKinney DeRoyston, McKinney DeRoyston, and myself, Dr. Alicia Mutri. And you'll hear us refer to that as the joint venture. We had an opportunity as colleagues to come together to do this work, and we are together, joining together to create this venture to be able to figure out how, in fact, we can support MMSD and the work that needs to be done. And so today's work, I wanna be able to just kind of set the stage to what's being done. Um, I am um, actually on the road, but it was extremely important for me to be physically here today. So I'm gonna set the stage for what you can anticipate and my colleagues are gonna take over. That's the important piece about being that joint venture. We do things together and it really is a, a, an amazing um, experience thus far. So what you'll notice today, we're gonna be talking about our, our approach as far as what we've done to date and how we've always, every time we've come before the board or when we've come in front of the um, cabinet, we've talked a lot about the stages of implementation and what that looks like, that has been our approach. Uh, we have done a lot of work today. It's hard to believe that, you know, we started this back in the fall of 2022, it's, it's gone so fast. Um, then we'll share with you some of the data sources. We know that's an important piece of where are we, where, where are we coming up with all of the information that we're coming up? We've got a lot of data that we've looked at. We've come together with some common themes and then we together kind of created that joint venture recommendation. So you'll notice that this will be aligned to the report that should have been received. So. I'm going to pass the baton over to my colleague, and we're going to jump right into Dr. McKinney DeRoyce and talking about our approach. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Good evening, everyone. So we want to just review our approach first, and we want to be clear about the understanding underneath this work and how this work is guided. So first, our understanding is that this work is part of a comprehensive approach to strategic change that includes using gradual release of responsibility and research-informed tools to identify benchmarks of success, to coach leaders and educators to become more confident and skilled and to facilitate equitable systems change. So I want you to attend to the table in front of you and really focus on the yellow and blue columns and note that we've completed the work in phase one. And what the report is that we've submitted is one of the early pieces of phase two. And in this phase two, which here we are in spring 2023, is really about developing, right? So it's where we make intentional decisions about the work that's to be done. We build the processes and infrastructure to do the work, and we ensure that we have the resources to do this work. So we are not yet at the phase, if you look three and four, where we're doing the work, we're actually at the phase of starting to come to agreement about what the work is and how we're going to move forward. So if we just use an analogy, now that we're here in spring of uh, farmers, because we're in an agricultural society here in Wisconsin, we have previously kind of begun to figure out what we wanna do. We've begun to really think about what we wanna plant. We've started to think about these things, but we're not yet planting the seeds, right? We're not actually digging in and doing the planting work. Instead, we've done the infrastructural work, not infrastructure, we've done the initial work to begin to understand what we need to do, right? We've understood what's been grown in the past. We've understood how the land has been used. And now we're moving towards plotting out what we're going to do and what we're going to grow. So we really want to dig into this. And we say that because a lot of what we do sometimes is want to do, 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 and jump into implementation, into using and improving, instead of really digging into what are we creating and why. So I just want us to situate there. Um, and so we're really trying to actively engage in the second phase about um, how we're going to engage in the work moving forward. So we want to share with you um, some of the work that we've done to date. I'm not gonna read the slide out to you, but we've done a lot of work in terms of trying to understand the ways of work that are already in process and trying to establish an understanding of how folks uh, see the strategic framework, the goals behind the strategic, that constitute the strategic framework. And we've done a lot of data review of existing data. We've done some additional targeted feedback sessions with community partners, including we've done some surveys using uh, MMSD's Let's Talk, as well as a Google form. And we've participated in many of the district's activities. So the data sources that we have been reviewing during phase one and that are constituted 
in uh, the work of uh, phase two and what's represented in our report is that first of all, we did not include a lot of student outcome data in our report. I just wanna note that for everyone. And I wanna note that this is a very intentional move on our part. And the reason is, is because what we're engaging in is a systemic analysis. And the failure of the system to meet the needs of its students as reported through the mechanisms of the district and the state are not the fault of the students, right? The systems measures that which it's designed to measure. It sees that which it is designed to see. We see these metrics as a measure of system health, not student achievement or well being. We're talking about system outcomes. And so you will recognize that in the full report. That's not to say we didn't include students, and I will talk to you about that in a second. So these are the various um, artifacts that we reviewed and began to synthesize, including the strategic plan, local media reports, and a lot of the data and products that are already developed by MMSD and that people have given lots of feedback on. And I should say, we also hesitated and resisted engaging a lot of additional feedback because we've heard from our community members, be that community partners, be that parents and families, be that staff, that there's been a lot of data shared and they want to hear the feedback about what has already been shared and see what the attraction has been on that. So the data that we reviewed include surveys, and input from students, families, and community members, including some of the climate surveys from schools, includes data that's been collected on staff, uh, information that we've received and conversations we've had with the Board of Education, as well as conversations that we've received and uh, inf data that we've received in conversations that we've had with community partners, as well as with consultants to the district. So in our work, we talk about creating feedback loops to ensure that folks know how the input they're offering is included in the work being done. And so we want to be very clear that today, we're going to share with the folks that we've talked with um, the opportunity to engage in this presentation and engage in the board docs related to it so they can see how their feedback is being responded to and is being leveraged towards recommendations within this report. And we really highly encourage people to engage these materials. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Gail Anderson. Thank you, Dr. McKinney to Royston. So you heard a lot about the work that we've done to better understand the current context within which the, the district is engaging with the strategic framework. And as we went through and we listened and we reviewed the various data sources and we started synthesizing that existing data and stakeholder input, we learned a lot. And what we learned, we distilled into four common themes. We've also identified some specific recommendations that are aligned with each of the themes. And we'll make sure we're sharing some samples of the recommendations later in this presentation. We wanna make sure that you're also aware that there's additional information regarding the themes and related recommendations that are in greater detail in the full report. So when we in themes that arose, we just wanna make sure you have a chance to look at the information that's on these slides. What we see here specifically related to goals one, two, and three. And as we listened, it became evident that there was an emerging theme, one that resonates across all the goals, that there's a gap between the fiscal and human resources available and those that are required to do the work that the district is currently engaged in. We heard that in the state of the district. We heard that with the H recent, recent HR presentation. And so that's something that we want to make sure that we're calling attention to because it does cut across all the themes. That quick overview of the four themes should sound familiar because they really reflect other reports you've recently received, including the equity report and that HR presentation that I referenced earlier. And the themes echo the resounding need to recalibrate and really make a commitment to the goals and processes so the district can live the work of achieving the district vision. Dr. McKinney to Royston, I'll let you take, take it from here. Thank you. 
So what we want to offer here in terms of the sample recommendation is just a brief overview of some of the recommendations that we're offering in relation to each specific theme. Um, I want to give you a chance to, to kind of digest these. And I, again, really invite you to dig into the fuller report. Um, but many of these speak to the things that we've heard across the data review and also across the input sessions that we've um, that we've uh, that we've had with some of the strategic partners for the district. Dr. Mucci, would you like to do this slide? So this slide really talks a little bit about the success um, criteria. And so when we think about that, we wanted to give a sense of um, what this approach may look like um, when we begin to think about the success criteria. And what we want to point out here is that when we begin to think about the success uh, criteria, the actual criteria will be co-developed as a part of phase two. And what we'll do is to ensure that everyone engaged will have an opportunity to know what this work clearly is, it's communicated, and we'll go even as specific as to say, what, what will this look like? Parents will, students will, the district will, the superintendent will. We'll begin to think a little bit about when we think about the success criteria, that's what we're gonna really push to do. So when we um, look at um, leveraging um, existing strengths and opportunities, I think that's gonna be really important to figure out where are we, what can we leverage, and then how do we utilize some of the strengths that the district has? And so again, I won't, as uh, Dr. McKinney DeRoyson said, you know, it's not important to read to you, but really begin thinking about, you know, how do we go about uh, building the leaders and the community partners to understand exactly what we're looking for, how will each stakeholder contribute um, and to, to help with the specific framework goals and the progress toward these goals. And so I'll just stop right there with that part and then uh, pass it back to you. Sure. And we want to be clear that the success criteria on the prior slide is an example of what it might look like, right? And that it's really the work of the, the, the district in partnership with the joint venture to determine what uh, that success criteria is, what to define what success looks like, and then to move forward with how we think about um, developing uh, assessments for that success and evaluating that success. So we also want to offer up what it looks like to begin to shift from having a plan to living a plan. And again, this is an example. So this example here provides a first step in building the infrastructure that is needed to really live this work. So if you just look under the first bullet under immediate next steps for the work group, which is one of our recommendations is developing this work group, it really highlights the need to um, establish a common understanding of the problems to be solved before engaging in developing solutions and doing work differently. And for us, this is a, a really important point to develop the root, to develop an understanding of the root cause before developing a roadmap. Because what we know is that when we do work without an understanding of the problem, the solution, if that's what one can call it, that we develop will not actually address the concerns of the community, much less achieve the goals that we have for ourselves. So we're gonna end with that. I am gonna apologize for taking off my video for a second and being short on an earlier slide. I did have a young scholar at my door who needed some attention. Thank you all. So we'll pass it back to uh, Dr. Jenkins. Yes, uh, just wanna say thank you so much for that update. This month, as we said, you're going to continue to come back and give us an update as you're engaging with our community. And I just want to remind the board and the community again, we had um, you all come in as a part of trying to recalibrate, strategically recalibrate with our strategic framework uh, to ensure that the direction we're going, that we're listening to the voices of our community. And as many of you may have noticed, uh, we'll continue to do that. The board has gone out now on several listening sessions, also trying to listen. We've had a student ad hoc uh, committee that we've been listening to. And we know that this is a journey, but we wanted to, post pandemic, come together with the voices, uh, elevate voices, new voices in this space. And so I think that the work, uh, the way that you all are going out in the community and you're bringing it back <laughs> and you're giving it to us really straight. We really do appreciate that. 
because we know it's necessary as we move forward with the strategic direction of the district. During this time of a transition, um, of my own transition, we know that it's not an individual, it's a system. And so you're getting information that's going to help us as a team, those individuals who are charged with continuing with the work, to be able to do the work with the true voices of the community. And that's important. That's what makes me so proud here in Madison. Uh, we're not shy. Uh, we do speak on topics, and that helps inform our values. And as you will see, it's reflected in our budget as much as possible when we're going through. We're still facing difficult challenges of local, state, uh, and federal funding, but having true voices at the table will help us continue to collaborate around our ICS work, the equity audit, the human resource review, all of that. So thank you again, once again. Thank you. Now, Chair Muldrew. Chair Muldrew, I'd like to know that you're muted so we can't oh, hear you. Thank you. I wanna thank you all for joining us and I opened it for discussion or questions from board members. Um, I think I, I wanna ask you all kind of in moving forward beyond kind of the tilling the soil moment that we're in right now. I think that one of the things that is incredibly frustrating to our community is when they hear us receive this kind of information sometimes over and over again in a, in a lot of different ways. And then there isn't a clear plan that we can publicly acknowledge to address these concerns and move beyond them. How do you all see us engaging in the process of in addressing these concerns directly and, and moving beyond these concerns? Sure, I think um, the, the implementation process that Dr. McKinney de Royston shared in the presentation and that you've seen before with the phased approaches, as long as we're really true to those phases, we have to move from just studying and admiring the challenges as they currently exist to creating collective commitment and common understanding of what the work is that needs to be done, and then to actually develop the processes that make sure we're doing that work. And to be able to have some checkpoints, are we actually doing what we intend to do, right? Sometimes what we do doesn't match what we thought we were going to be doing. And we aren't measuring that. We aren't paying attention to that. And so when we get down the road and we don't see the impact of the work that we thought we were doing, we don't have a way to check whether we actually did what we said we were going to do. So that's an example of a process that we want to make sure is in place. And then there's really, it, it's there's an intentionality every step of the way. Let's understand what's currently being done. How does it align to the strategic goals and priorities? Does every person in the system see themselves in the work? As a parent, can I understand what it's going to look like for my family, for my children, when we meet these goals? As a staff member, do I understand what I'm going to be getting to help me make sure that I can meet the needs of those scholars who are in front of me day in and day out? And as a community, how does the district ensure that you're taking full advantage of the partners that are ready to step in and help and to make sure that you've got the resources you need going forward so that you can ensure that the work that matters most is what's happening every day. So there's gonna be a roadmap for it. And along with that roadmap, we have to make sure that we've got the ways to measure that we're actually on track to getting there. So it's not five years from now that we're saying, where are we? Why aren't we there yet? Um, but really making sure that there's communication back and forth all the way through is another key consideration. And if I can just jump in, Gail. Yeah. That's please. actually what we're talking about in terms of the roadmap is actually the work of phase two that we're in right now is creating the infrastructure. So like you're saying with the tilling of the soil, right? We've tilled the soil and now we have to say, okay, what are we, what are we trying to plant? Who's gonna plant this, right? Who's going to harvest it? Right, so that's really digging into the meat of how we're going to do the work and creating that roadmap before we start doing the work. Because one of the things that, that we have seen as I think are reflected in our themes and in our recommendation is that 
there's a lot of things that the district is already doing that can be leveraged, a lot of resources that can be leveraged, but also there's a deep need to prioritize the work. I think everyone thinks that they're working hard and they are. And then if people are not seeing the results of that hard work, the question is, is how do you prioritize the work so that the impact can be felt from that degree of labor? So as we get ready to plant the seeds, we go from tilling to saying, okay, what do these seeds need to thrive? And let's make sure we're creating those conditions. So we're moving beyond surviving and getting to the point where we're thriving. And I'm gonna add one more, since we're on the whole farmer analogy, also looking at the seeds to determine which seeds do we really need to plant? And let's come to a collective agreement because we can't plant everything. But as we look at the data that has been collected from joint venture, from this HR report, from the equity report, from the things that you already know, how do we have a consensus? How do we kind of take you through and walk you through a collective agreement process so that we pick two or three seeds because we can't plant everything, but right away, how do we plant, plant two or three, create the roadmap that goes along with that, the su success criteria that goes along with that, how do we communicate with that, and then more importantly, how do we check what we expect, right? How do we go about ensuring that what we were intending to happen happens and then that we can course correct when necessary? So when, when you ask like what would happen, it would sort of look similar to that. I, I very much appreciate the the metaphor that is kind of the the soil slash you know space of planting and harvesting, and I think when we talk about kind of the implementation plan um, and kind of the phases of the impl implementation plan, that can feel pretty abstract um, in terms of the material benefits for kids. If I'm worried about my child right now today, um, listening to folks talk about the phases of kind of implementation could feel like, wait, does that mean two years from now, my kid's gonna get what they need? Does that mean that we're working towards uh, addressing what educators need and that next year will look very different than this year? Um, and so I think when I when I have these conversations as a board member, I think about what it feels like for, for a parent to listen to us have this conversation when you are terrified um, about, about how, how school is working out for your baby. Um, I, I think about what it's like for teachers to listen to this conversation when they don't have the resources that they need to ensure the success of their students. Um, and I, I want to reconcile that with the plan we're coming together to create. I know there's no silver bullet. I know there's nothing that's instantaneous about this work that we have to be thoughtful. And I think we have to, uh, you know, tie the solution to the reality of, of the problem and how our community experiences those problems. I thank you all so much for your work. I think you've done a lot of work to bring together the different voices board members are hearing from all the time. And so just in synthesizing that feedback, um, you, have, you have given us the opportunity to really examine um, a variety of resources that, that we have at our fingertips um, that have salient themes. So thank you all very much for presenting this work, board member Vandermeulen. Nikki, I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Nikki, I'm sorry, we can't hear you and you froze briefly. Can you hear me? Got it. Sorry, my computer went bananas. Um, Mike, I appreciate it. I read the work. I apologize for not being able to see your whole presentation. I regret that and we'll catch, catch that online. One, thank you for all your hard work. I truly appreciate it. My only concern is the equity report never asked people on disability. They never asked students and parents of disabled children that that data was never disaggregated. Please, please, please don't do that. 14% of our student body, and that's a low estimate, are students with special needs. And so that's my only concern out of all of it. Otherwise, thank you for your work. I'm good. Thank you, thank you board member Vandermill. And further discussion or questions from board members? Board member Gomez-Schmidt. 
Thank you. Um, and thank you for the presentation. And again, like others have said, for bringing these um, many pieces that we have going on to, to reflect and look at what is happening in the district um, towards a vision um, of how this strategic framework can be implemented. The last thing on your report um, is the immediate next step of starting to build the roadmap for implementation, improvement, and impact. And it refers to a recalibration work group. Um, can you talk just a little bit more about what that would look like, that work group, and what the timeline is for um, that group coming together and, and moving forward with the implementation pieces that everybody's so eager um, to see happen? Sure. Dr. McKinney, Doryston, do you want to take that, or would you like me to? If you'd like to start, I'm happy to okay. back up. So I, I think it's, um, as it's been noted, there's a tension between the urgent and, and what needs to happen now and being planful and intentional about what happens down the road, right? There's inherent tension. So the purpose of bringing this work group together is to have some folks coming together who can really understand at a deep level the work that's currently happening that should be aligning with the strategic framework goals, to be able to identify um, folks who can be at the table from a district office through a building level so that the voices of different stakeholders within the district and outside of the district are incorporated into the work. And so we're meeting tomorrow with the strategic recalibration leadership group to come together and to start talking about who needs to be part of that team so that the work gets started quickly and starts moving forward in that really intentional way. Yep, and I will just add that uh, I think everyone is attending to the necessity of having some stability in our processes at this moment. And so that's why the formation of this group soon as a sort of stabilizing force to move this, continue to move this work forward over the next few months is critical. And we've expressed the urgency of this. I'm The, our, the MMS, MMSD is very clear about the urgency of this. And so, as um, Ms. Carol Anderson said, we're already meeting tomorrow to identify that group, so that group can begin to begin uh, to move the work forward very soon. I also just want to speak back to to um, board person Nikki's point around disability, and I hope you see that those conversations reflected in our recommendations because we've already had conversations with members of that community, and we're continuing these conversations. So um, I really uh, appreciate you lifting that up and I hope you dig into the report around that. I will, thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and just want to again say thanks for the, for the challenge of bringing um, a lot of different groups um, with a lot of different needs. We have you know 25,000 students and over 4,000 staff together to really bring this vision forward. I, I can't say how much and how important it's gonna be to bring people together collaboratively to do this work. And I do appreciate that. To me, it looks like you are have that as one of your focuses. So thank you. And it might be helpful to add before we sign off then in case there's other questions, that in phase two, we are continuing to have stakeholder feedback sessions. So for communities that we have not had a chance to talk with yet, they are not out of the process. They will be involved in the second phase. The first phase was really about reviewing and synthesizing that which we already know, as a, so that in phase two, we can have targeted conversations about that which we don't yet know, but need to know to move forward. And I just wanna put, pinpoint that because it is not the case that we have talked to everyone yet. There are still targeted communities that we are going to be talking to, but we're gonna be talking to them in targeted ways with very specific questions, as opposed to continuing to do very big data asks that require a lot of labor from those communities that they feel like they've already, already given to us and to the district. Thank you. Thank you, board member Gomez-Schmidt. Further discussion or questions from board members? All right. Thank you all for joining us. We're gonna move on now. Reports on items that proceeded through the instruction work group held on March 6, 2023, board member Castro. 
Yes, thank you so much. So um, this past month at the instruction work group, we continued our health services update. Uh, we received a report from Dr. Jackson on the uh, MMSD uh, equity audit, um, as well as the thinking and update on the middle school biliteracy material adoption and our ATSI and TSI federal designations uh, pursuant to some federal law. Uh, our next meeting we're looking at April 3rd, 2023, where we will receive the final recommendation for the middle school by literacy um, adoption and a update on the literacy task force recommendations and implementation. Thank you, Board Member Castro. We will now move on to items that proceeded through the March instruction, or I'm sorry, the March operation work group held on March 13th, 2023. Board Member Gomez-Schmidt. Thank you. Um, on March 13th, um, we received and discussed the recommendations from the Safety and Wellness Ad Hoc Committee, and we will be voting to formally receive those tonight. Um, we talked about the 2023-24 budget development process, uh, received a summary of the current revenue forecast and budget strategy, um, health care benefits um, in that 2023-24 will be the third year of the three-year contract um, for the health care benefits, and talked about the strategic budget alignment um, that is happening. Um, just one note that Due to the unusual timing of the state biennial budget, we will likely not know the revenue available for our budget until sometime in the late, later spring or summer, which um, inserts a whole lot of uncertainty into this budget process for us. Um, we do know that in the best case scenario right now for per pupil funding, absent of other increases, we'll have an increase of only 2.2% to our revenue limit, despite a record year of inflation. Um, and, and that's going to be extremely challenging. Um, another part of the meeting, we discussed um, human resources and the review that was presented to the district and strategies and steps that the department is going to take moving forward. Um, the next work group um, will be held on Monday, April 10th, and the main topic will be the preliminary budget. Um, we could also potentially discuss um, there's a couple of other topics, um, potentially partnerships, and one other thing that I will get back to you on. It'll be a surprise. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, they, they, thank you, Board Member Gomez Schmidt. I, I, I like that you're cracking jokes here at the end of your term. All right. We have no action items that proceeded through the instruction work group meeting held on March 6, 2023. Um, we have one action item that moved through the operation work group. Board member Gomez Schmidt, would you like to motion on that item? I can do that. I move that the Board of Education receive the recommendations from the st um, Safety and Student Wellness Ad Hoc Committee. Second, Maya. Any discussion or questions? Who is that? No, I'm saying no, but Johanna's advisory vote. Johanna, Johanna, your advisory vote. Yeah, I, I approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 7-0. I move that the Board of Education adopt and approve all of the motions set forth in Section 10 of the electronic agenda prepared for the March 22nd, 22nd, 2023 regular board meeting exactly as said motions are written. By voting affirmatively on this motion, a board member expresses his, her, or their affirmative vote on each of the motions consolidated hereby. Subject to any expressed separations that have been made by any member of the school board. Second, Maya. Any separations? Board Member Nichols? 10.29, please. Board Member Gomez Schmidt? 10.7.
Any others? I'm sorry, Laura. Okay. I'm sorry, does Nikki have her hand up? Oh, okay. Um, all right. I will ask for a vote then. All those in favor, aye. Oh, I'm sorry, Joanna, your advisory vote. Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> All those in favor, aye. Motion carries 7 0. I move that the Board of Education improve an expenditure in the amount of 135,650 from the fiscal year ESSER from the fiscal year 2023 ESSER funds and 135,650 from the fiscal year 2024 curriculum and instruction budget for the purchase of ACT prep and pre-ACT prep from Cambridge Educational Service for for the 2022-2023 summer semester. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, I, I just pulled this one because I need to recuse myself from the vote due to a conflict of interest. Okay. Thank you, Board Member Gomez Schmidt. Further discussion? Joanna, your advisory vote. Yep, I approve. All those in favor? Aye. Any abstentions? Any recusals? Motion carries 6 0. Mm -mm. Board Member Nichols, did you want to read this motion or do you want me to move? Okay. I move that the board approve an additional expenditure not to exceed 19737 from the human resources support work provided by Dr. Linda Anderson using funding from the fiscal year 2023 district-wide operating budget. Second for the sake of discussion. Any discussion? Yes, thank you. Um, I would actually like to amend this main motion. Um, and here's a, I'll tell you what the amendment language is in just a moment and, and my rationale. This motion is very specific. The dollar amount is very specific. And if you read the consent memo, the dates are very specific. I think given the circumstances that we find ourselves in, in needing support in HR and wanting to bring um, this consultant in, I'm not sure that we should lock ourselves in to the dollar amount specifically and the beginning and end date so specifically because we don't know what additional support we may need from this consultant. Um, so I am proposing this amendment. Um, I move that the Board of Education approve an additional expenditure for HR support to be provided by Dr. Linda Anderson, not to exceed the current rate that the Board of Education is approving for consultants um, hired by the board. I'll second for the sake of discussion. And there was a lot in that. So if I need to restate, let me know. I want to open it up for discussion, but I, I want to ask a technical and procedural question first. The amount of 19737 doesn't actually meet the board's procurement standard for this meeting or for our consent agenda. I want, I want to better understand how we got to that and, and why this is showing up here. Okay. So um, the board and I believe the data is actually in the memo, had already approved a contract for mm -hmm. Dr. Anderson to provide mentoring um, to staff. Um, so she, she has already started performing that work, and that initial amount was $75,000. That is why we have to come back, because we're asking her to do additional things, and we need to allocate for those additional tasks that we're asking her to do, because it is still her intention 
to complete <laughs> the initial contract and take on this work as well. And so that is why we had to bring it back to the board because it is, that would take us even further over the threshold by which the board is required to vote. Thank you so much for speaking to that and for that clarification. Um, in addition to that question, I want to ask around Nichelle's amendment. Is there indica any indicator from Dr. Linda Anderson herself that the dates that you have in there are based on her availability and that she would no longer be available to the board beyond those dates? I believe she actually indicated that she is available to the board for approximately 120 days. Okay. Would we want to substitute the 120 days for the date we have right now? Or does the date we have right now take up 120 days? No, the date we have right now is approximately six to nine weeks, which would mean we would then have to come back to the board again. Okay. That's it for, for my questions. Further discussion from the board. Board member Vandermulen, I saw your hand up. Yes, I'm unmuted this time, luckily. Correct? You're unmuted. Good. Um, thank you. Appreciate that. No, um, one, on a side note, I think we need to relook at the procurement policy because 35000 seems a little high in this budgetary era where every dollar is important, but that's something for another day at another time. What I what I do say is this, I like the specificity, but I think Ali is right that the 120 days is probably the best way. So if there's a way to combine Ali's suggestion as a friendly amendment in Michelle's motion, I would be fine with it. Board Member Nichols. Yes, so I, I appreciate that. Um, I think the one thing though, is that if we extend the number of days, we should expect that a the rate or the dollar amount would also change. And I don't know what that is in the moment. Um, I, I'm saying that because usually consultants are agreeing to not only the type of work duties, but their time. And so I'm not sure if we add the 120 days to be more specific, what that means on the, the dollar amount. So I don't know if there's a suggestion on how to um, perhaps modify again. So I see board member Pearson, board member Gomez Schmidt. I want to acknowledge what, what both Nikki and, and board member Nichols are speaking to. And I want to ask Sherry to chime in in terms of the best way to amend at this point. So I, I think that the board can't pass a motion that has kind of a like no dollar amount attached, you know, um, and simultaneously, I think it's a very demanding thing to say, let's recalculate and, and renegotiate on the floor. Um, so what is what is your recommendation, council? Um, in the vein of what um, board member Nichols has um, suggested, um, the currently the board does have one other consultant under contract, and I'd have to look at the specific daily rate. Um, and we could just say 120 hours. Mm -hmm. I, uh, can you hear me now, Nikki? Nikki, can you hear Sherry? Okay, I think so. Um, so what we could do is I could look at for that rate and say 120 days at X rate. Um, and that would be, we'd figure out what exactly 120 days is and actually put that into the contract. Board member Pearson and then board member Gomez Schmidt. Yeah, I think um, the amendment that Nichelle basically uh, mentioned. I can't hear anyone. Um, Nikki, we have our mics on. You, can you hear me? Okay. Um, sorry, Nikki. We have our mics on and we're talking, so I'm not exactly sure what the fix is. Um, do other people in the Zoom can hear me? Okay. Okay. 
Nikki, we're gonna mm, can't hear me. <laughs> Nikki, we're going It's just these moments where you're like, oh, the chat would come in handy. Yeah. <laughs> I sent. I'm sorry, folks. We're gonna establish whether or not everybody can't hear us. Okay. You can hear us, okay? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we were just trying to. Got it. Um, Got it. Okay, we were just trying to establish to make sure that um, board member uh, Nikki Vandermeulen could hear us on her Zoom. Um, and so we have established that um, Zoom world and YouTube world can hear us. Um, I was going back to my comments about Nichelle's original amendment. Um, I think it is specific enough to allow us to go back and determine um, what we need to for the contract. Um, and it allows us to then in the contract itself to specify the 120 days and dollar amounts. So I'm not necessarily sure if we would need to have dollar amounts in this motion, um, but, and I agree with you about trying to negotiate a contract on the floor is, is somewhat difficult um, in that vein. Uh, so I, I'm good with uh, without the 120 days, but I can understand why we would want to possibly add that there. Board member Goma Schmidt. Yeah, I was I was just going to suggest that for most of the contracts that come to us through consent, it does always have a not to exceed because I, I think that's parts really important because I, I would not want to leave that just open ended. Um, and so if I I'm I'm not quite sure. I don't, I don't know if Sherry or someone can speak to how that nineteen thousand seven hundred and thirty seven was calculated based on the amount of time that it is laid out. Um, in the memo. Um, yeah. Oh, Ross is not <laughs> doing math. <laughs> um, but I, I think some, some amount up to, and then you all, if it has to come back to the board, you can vote again. You can, it can go in a consent and it can be explained why it needs to be extended. So I, I would be comfortable voting with it as it is written. Um, and then it could come back to all of you. That being said, I won't be voting on it again, but um, procedurally, I think that allows you to actually assess where you're at after the six weeks. And if you still need that and, and Dr. Anderson feels like there's more work that she can help with and Dr. Jenkins agrees with that and you all agree with that, then you can move forward. Um, that's just a suggestion. Dr. Jenkins? Yeah, and, and I agree. Just trying to negotiate on the floor. Yes, yes, and a lot of yeses. But the one thing right now, you could just say up to $90,000 is coming back every month. This is also a month to month contract. You can end it in a month, in particular, being that we're going to continue to search for a senior executive director. You may hire somebody in a month, a two month, and then it may not even be filled at that 120 day situation. So as it was written with the uh, additional piece that I think board member Nichols and um, the added, even what um, board member Pearson said, it doesn't even have to be that dollar amount, but if you're more comfortable saying a dollar amount, $90,000 up to not to exceed, and you don't have to use that amount, but it, you won't have to keep coming back. Right. And typically when we do that, if consultants, mm -hmm. then if it's decided that we no longer lead, need the services, we just issue them notices. It's in all our contracts that the contract will end and she will move on to her next client. Further discussion? Board member Gomez Schmidt? Yeah, I'm going to recommend that if we amend it to put a, another dollar amount in, that it be 25000 not up to 90000 That seems excessive given the amount that was in there at 19, almost 20,000. You want to expand it a little bit um, and see how far that gets you and um, how it's working. That that seems to be logical to me. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Again, I think it has to be a not to exceed in there. Um, 
And if you want to take the dates out, okay, but it, it um, yeah, I think it should have that not to exceed. And just to be clear, if you're saying only an additional 2530, that means she's not going to complete her other work. Because the other work is what um, the 19,000 comes because we've already agreed to 75. Correct. So then the only amount of additional work you're going to get is $20,000. If, and board member Nichols is saying, she keeps the original that the board has already voted on for 75,000 and adds something where it gives her and the board time to determine within the parameters of what she presented and based on our policy, you could go up to June 30th. And so then at June 30th, Either we've decided we no longer need your services, but we've already approved it, or we decide, you know what, we need you beyond June 30th. Um, because right now, you again, only for HR purposes, you would only be getting her for an additional $20,000 worth of work. And that was my understanding is what okay. the recommendation was coming forward from administration. That's what that memo reads, is that it's for an additional $19,737 on top of the 75. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's in addition. Right. It, so what they did, just put, it would end up being, you're right, $89,000. Correct. Actually, on the memo, there is a dollar amount of $94,373. So were we to shift to $90,000, we would actually be lessening the threshold. And I think what we're talking about is an expansion of the threshold to include more time. Right. I'm going to say in, in a serious way, like mm -hmm. I am I'm struggling to vote on the amendment, not because I think the attention of the amendment is off in any way. I actually completely agree that we, this is kind of our first move in the right direction towards resolving some of the issues we're having in HR. I greatly appreciate this coming to the board and the, 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 um, the speed at which we are, we are moving into action after some of the feedback we've heard recently around HR. Part of the reason I struggle to vote on the amendment is I, I assume that you all discussed thoroughly with her, both the work, the timeline, and the amount before this meeting. And I, I think it's hard to renegotiate something that um, directly impacts another person's work without having them at the table to be part of that discussion. Um, I think that we would be adjusting this and then hoping that she is comfortable with those adjustments. So I greatly appreciate you saying, you no, know, she has voice that she's available um, for for more time, um, but she hasn't had to have hasn't had the ability to voice what her rate would look like or what the additional work would look like um, in terms of of that additional time. And so I, at this point, um, favor the the original motion and and would vote would be more confident in voting for the original motion um, than than broadening the motion at this point. Um, is there any further discussion on the amended language? Board member Vandermeulen and board member. Yes. Um, my, my opinion is I thought it was the way I took it was we agreed on the 75,000 and then it was the additional 20,000. I think it needs to go back to the board. I think Michelle's motion is good, but here's my problem. I don't believe it should be, I think it needs to keep the end date. We absolutely have an end date. And also we need to, sorry, I said the wrong word, not the end date. We need to have the exact amount. We can't just say up to, we have to say not exceeding because otherwise I'm sorry, I'm not comfortable with a blank check. I realize the importance of the work. I also understand how tight this budget is. And as much as I want HR as successful as possible, I can't do a blank check. So the up 
up to and not to exceed must be in there for me to support it. What member Pearson? So essentially we would have to come back um, to approve the contract if we were to not put an end, well, if we didn't put an end date um, or a dollar amount, we wouldn't necessarily need to come back. It would just be done at the contract time, correct? The amendment. That would be correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. But with the amendment that's on the floor now, it would allow us to determine the contract um, with her directly, even if it was to be the 120 days at whatever rate. Sherry? Okay. Uh, Nikki, did you hear Sherry? No, I could barely hear that. Um, so what I said was it, the dollar amount wouldn't be open. Actually, the motion it, on the floor is to reflect what the board is currently paying for its only consultant. I would look, and I believe that rate is approximately 90 ish dollars an hour. But the board could set, and I think this is where board member Nichols was going. You could set and say, we agree that the 19,000 isn't enough. So we're comfortable with say 25,000. And then come back once she's used that additional 25,000 to evaluate whether we wanna continue. I think the ask is that it's just more than 20,000 because that's likely not gonna get us much service on the additional. Okay. Um, and so, but she has expressed that she could give us 120 days. So if, even if we did a limited, at this point, a limited contract addition, um, it then. then it would be fine to come back to her and then um, ask for um, more time. Would it be, if you take 120 days, it's more, so about like four to one, two, three, four. Four months. Four months. Um, and so essentially we're just doing the two months right now. Um, okay, that's all my questions. Okay. I just wanted to say that I don't think it's a good precedent to move away from doing an exceed a certain dollar amount with any of the contracts that we're approving. And I, 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 I think that we received this recommendation attached to our agenda from our administration saying that this was the amount and this, these were the dates. And I, I think we should approve it based on that. I, I'm not, I'm a little confused as to how we're, um, negotiating with each other on the floor about the time and the amount um, when we have the recommendation from Dr. written right in front of us. So it would be my recommendation to go ahead and approve this. And if more time and more resources are needed to continue the work as you get into May and closer to that end date, then it can be taken up by the board in May. Pearson. Ross, what are the implications of extending it 120 days, which would mean that it goes into the next fiscal year? Uh, technically speaking, we should only be approving something from this budgetary year that goes through June 30th. Uh, 120 days would put us beyond that point, in which point we would have to have a new contract to discuss for fiscal 24. Thank you so much for speaking to that, Ross. Board Member Nichols? You didn't hear what he said.
I feel like, Sherry, are you prepared to repeat what Ross just said? <laughs> I can repeat it if no one, someone knows. Right, Do you want me to repeat it? Okay, so the fiscal year ends June 30th. Um, typically what we do is then redraft a new contract starting July 1st. Um, and so that's why he's saying that we would do, we could, if the board, at the board's pleasure, draft a contract through, through June 30th for some amount, and then come back to the board, reassess where we are, July, and be prepared to enter into a new contract for the new fiscal year starting July 1st. Thank you. Board Member Nichols. Well, since I'm the person that made the amendment, um, I, I am hearing my colleagues' concerns about not having a specific dollar amount in either the not to exceed um, or just the, the flat out amount. Um, and I do agree with board member Gomez Schmidt that I, I don't think it sets a good precedent for us to be approving any contract um, without a dollar amount, even if the consultant were, were not to use the full amount. Um, I know that we are gonna be entering a very busy time as a board and um, with the upcoming search process um, for a new superintendent. We also know that we have um, a pretty critical and urgent need to stabilize and support human resources right now as we are entering our peak hiring um, season. So I think that um, we definitely need um, Dr. Anderson on board. I um, and I also appreciate the fact that we don't want to really do this level of by dollar, by our work on the floor. Um, let's see. The amendment that I suggested did not include a, a dollar amount. So I don't know that I have a, uh, an updated amendment language to come up to a reasonable um, dollar amount. So. I guess I can rescind the amendment at this time. Further discussion? I'm gonna read the original motion again, just so that we're kind of in alignment with where we started. If folks have more discussion or additional or adjusted amendments, um, I wanna make sure we have space for that. I move that the Board of Education approve an additional expenditure not to exceed $19,737 for human resources support work provided by Dr. Linda Anderson using funding from the fiscal year 2023 district-wide operating budget. Second. So it is seconded. Any discussion? Joanna, your advisory vote. I approve. All those in favor, aye. Any abstention? Any opposed? Any recusal? Motion carries 6 0. We'll now hear from the City of Madison Education Committee. Yes, unfortunately, we were not able to hold our meeting on March 8th. Um, we were not able to find another date in March to reschedule. So our next uh, committee meeting will be on April 26th. We'll now hear from Student Senate. Sorry, my computer just like unloaded. But uh, so we had our meeting on March 8th.
Um, we did a forces of change activity. So we talked about like issues that we see inside of our schools and how we want to fix it, what steps we're going to take to fix those um, issues that we see. We had committee meetings. So we have three committees now in Student Senate. And we did we shared election information for people who are going to be running for this position and Student Senate President for next year. Um, there is a current Student Senate meeting happening right now. I think it just ended. And our next meetings will probably be April 5th and April 19th. Thank you, Joanna. Madison School Community and Recreation Advisory Committee, Board Member Vandermeulen. My last, uh, our last meeting was March 15th. Our supervisors, Aline Otis and Ian Hanna, gave a, present, a very well-received presentation on MSCR school-based programs. Staff also shared a virtual tour of MSCR West, which is slated to open June 12th. Registration for summer 2023 programs for MSCR started on March 13th. We have 6,642 participants registered on the first day. That's up 15% for last year. And individuals and families requesting fee assistance were given priority registration, which is something I'm quite pleased with. Our next meeting is June 21st. Thank you, Chair. I move that the Board of Education dissolve the Citizens Ad Hoc Committee relative to the renaming of Jefferson Middle School. The school was renamed Ezekiel Gillespie Middle School on February 27th, 2023. Second, Maya. Any discussion? Joanna, your advisory vote. I approve. All those in favor, aye. Nikki, I'm sorry. Were you voting in favor? I'm, re I'm recused because it's a Jefferson ad hoc. I cannot vote on it. Thank you so much, Nikki. The motion carries 6-0. We'll now hear from the policy committee, board member Castro or board member Gomez Schmidt. Uh, so the policy committee met this week and discussed our progress with N Neola. Uh, and so Neola is working with our finance department first, and we expect our first round of recommendations to come to the board in May. We will further discuss how many policies the board can expect to review per month and a possible standing policy meeting for the board to review policies every month. Furthermore, we can expect um, an updated graduation re requirement policy to come to the board sometime this summer. Um, and at an upcoming board retreat, the policy committee would like to engage the board in thinking about a process and how board members can bring new policy change suggestions uh, to the policy committee and administration for review. And finally, the policy committee has heard and would like to prioritize the following policies, those being um, public records, school renaming, and uh, public records, school renaming, and um, uh, the three policies that we have to review on an annual basis. Thank you, Board Member Castro. Board Governance Committee, Board Member Simkin or Board Member Nichols? The Board Governance Committee will be issuing a request for quotes from consultants and or organizations who provide Board of Education training on board governance. This is a follow-up item to our last board retreat where we continue to have conversations about board governance and then wanting to get more information about what it would actually cost and what the time investment would be to invest in board governance training. Uh, the goal is to review those responses and discuss at the next board retreat. Thank you, board member Nichols. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those, oh, Joanna, your advisory vote. Yes, I approve. 
All those in favor, aye. 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 Motion carries 7-0. Have a nice night, y'all. Good night, y'all.